Well, good morning. Welcome to our online Sunday service broadcast. Lord willing, we'll be able to meet together again on May 31st. And so we are longing for that day with great anticipation. So please pray along with us that we'll have everything ready for you so that we can meet together again in a safe way. And again, if you need anything, please let us know. If you need prayer of any, of any kind, there's a link down below where, we, where you can submit prayer requests and we can pray for you. There's also a link down below where you can request assistance for people to go and pick you up groceries or medicine or supplies. And then again, there's a link down below where you can continue to give to the budget of the church or to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering to make the gospel known in North America. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 103. Psalm 103. So please read along with me this psalm as we hear the Lord calling us to worship. Psalm 103, beginning in verse one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works in righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed." He made known his way to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more." But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. Now we're going to go into a time of prayer. We're going to pray through the Acts model. And so we're going to pray a prayer of adoration, a prayer of confession, a prayer of thanksgiving, and a prayer of supplication. And so take time now in your homes as families or as individuals and, and just take time to praise the Lord, to confess your sins to the Lord, to thank the Lord for what he has done, and to ask the Lord to to provide for your needs. Go ahead and take time now and do that. Father, we bless you with all that is within us. We bless your holy name. 
We will not forget all that you have done for us. We praise you for you have forgiven all our iniquity. You have healed our diseases. You have redeemed our lives from the pit. Lord, we praise you for you have crowned us with steadfast love and mercy. You satisfy us with what is good. Lord, you renew us. Lord, we praise you for you work righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. We praise you for your all your works are recorded in Holy Scripture. We praise you for you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, we confess our sins to you. We have sinned against you in so many ways. We have willfully broken your law. We have done what is wrong in your sight and we have not done what you have commanded us to do. Lord, we deserve your wrath. We deserve your holy, righteous anger. But Lord, we thank you because your wrath and your anger were poured out on Jesus on the cross. You do not deal with us according to our sins. You do not repay us according to our iniquities. Your love for us, for those who fear you, is higher than the heavens are above the earth. Lord, you have removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. You have been a father to us and have showed us compassion. For we are dust, and to dust we will return. Our days are like grass, like a flower that is here today and gone tomorrow. But your love, O Lord, your love endures forever. We thank you that you are a great and faithful covenant-keeping God. You will not abandon us. You will hold us and keep us until the end, and we will live with you forevermore. We pray now that we would do your word and obey the voice of your word. We pray that we would do your will. We pray that you would speak to us this morning and that we would kill what is earthly in us and live for you and for you alone. May you receive glory and honor forevermore. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, now that we have read and prayed Psalm 103, let's sing it together. Would you sing with me as we declare this song? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord and bless the Lord.
my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Let's sing, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Again, worship your holy, worship your holy name, Lord. I'll worship your holy As we sing this next song, would you hear this verse from Psalm chapter 130? Verse 5, we read, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Church family, today is my prayer that our hope is in God's word and in our Lord Jesus. Out of the depths, out of the depths, I cry to you. In darkest places, I will call. Incline your ear to me anew, and hear my cry for mercy, Lord. To count my sinful ways How could I come before your throne Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze And I stand redeemed by grace alone And I will wait for you I will wait for you On your word I will rely Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. So put your hope in God alone. 
take courage in his power to say completely and forever one by Christ emerging from the grave his steadfast love his steadfast love has made a way and God himself has paid the price that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice and I will wait for you I will wait for you through the storm and through the night and I will wait for you surely wait for you for your love is my delight and I will wait for you I will wait for you on your word I will rely I will wait for you surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied Good morning. This is uh, becoming quite uh, old. We uh, 
don't get to see you, you get to see us. We do miss your faces and trust that all of you are doing well and continuing to lean into the Lord during these days. Quite uh, surreal, our circumstances uh, around the globe even. So we, uh, we continue to pray for one another. We continue to pray for our leaders. And we continue to look forward, as Luke said earlier, to uh, being together again soon, May 31st. We're counting the days. I'd like for you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, as we finish up our journey through this short letter. And um, as I said last week, I hope that you found it to be fruitful in your life. And uh, I know it has been in mine. Look forward to continuing to apply the precious truths here in this word in my life. And trust that you are as well. I'm going to begin reading with verse number one as we look at this fifth and final chapter. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow, fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-mindful. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his e eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're thankful again for your provision in our lives. It's true that um, our lives look nothing like what we anticipated three, four, six months ago. Things have changed. Things continue to change. We, Lord, um, face the reality that uh, life will forever be different because of what we've been through in recent weeks. So we ask you, Lord, to move in our hearts and minds in a providential and powerful way. That you give us, Lord, the ability to see this world and all that it entails through your eyes and not be limited to our human expectations and desires. That you would speak to us as only you can. That you would shape us and form us, Lord, according to your good pleasure. Lord, we pray. We do pray and intercede for those, Lord, that serve in places of leadership whether it be uh, on a national level, Lord, all around the world in various countries, uh, on state levels, 
particularly those here in our own state, as they seek to lead, make decisions, encourage uh, those that they're responsible for to do things that uh, benefit all of us, that contribute to the common good. And Lord, even in our church family, you've put structure in place even here. And we pray for your wisdom and your direction to manifest itself, to abound in the hearts and lives of those who lead. And Lord, all of us who seek to follow, there's a common denominator here presented in this passage of Scripture, and that is humility. That we are all to be characterized by humility, clothed in it. We pray that, Lord, you might make it so, and that we would receive it gladly, warmly, enthusiastically, for your glory and for our good. And so now we ask you to speak from your word, to stir our hearts and our minds in ways that, Lord, we didn't dream possible, that you might draw us unto yourself in a way that we would not be the same again. That we would walk away, Lord, not as uh, one who has looked at an image in the mirror and walked away and forgotten it, but one who goes away changed and reshaped because of it. I pray for those that, Lord, are in the, within the sound of my voice, who may be observing via distance, Lord, maybe for the first time that they have ventured out to encounter uh, a body of believers centered around your word, I pray that this morning they might hear your truth with clarity, that they might hear your truth in a very personal way, and that, Lord, you might uh, encounter them, even begin a long-term, everlasting relationship with them. So give us all ears to hear, hearts and minds that are eager and ready to obey, to follow you, no matter what you may ask. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Science writer Hope Yarin states the obvious. The most essential thing for a plant's survival is putting down roots. She calls taking root a big gamble. But if the seed takes root, it can go down 12, 30, maybe even 40 meters. And the results are extraordinary. A tree's roots can swell and split bedrock and move gallons of water daily for many years. If and when the root takes hold in this manner, the plant becomes almost indestructible. No matter what's going on above the surface, with a well, well-established well root that's intact, this plant, this tree, can grow back once, even more than once, multiple times if necessary. It all depends on how well settled in, established the root system is. This is a helpful picture, I think, for us in understanding what Peter is trying to get across to his audience. Christ followers should expect this life to be filled with suffering, persecution, with difficult things. It's going to be one storm after another. However, Deep roots equip and enable us to survive the adversities we face and make it possible even for us to thrive in such adversities. This passage is an important one. I believe there are two primary overarching points to be considered in this text. In the latter part of the text, he directs us to the call to faith. To the call to faith. What is a Christian? What is a Christ follower? How do you define one? Specifically, he elaborates on the community of faith and how the community properly thrives even in a challenging world. So on one hand, we're thinking about what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a Christ follower. And then in the midst of an adversarial world, an antagonistic world, how does 
the body of Christ, the community of faith, function? How should it function? So let's begin thinking about this call to faith. And many of us have inaccurate, unrealistic expectations about this thing we call Christianity. Many of us believe that once you come to Christ that your life is going to be wonderful after that, that you're going to just walk through this flower garden enjoying life and encounter no problems. Well, the bad news is nothing could be further from the truth. We are not set apart. We are not sheltered, shielded from the things going on in this world. In fact, after studying through Peter's letter here, we should be under the impression that Christians should expect maybe even more difficulty than the average person would for the cause of Christ. The good news is that ultimately we will know the life that you're thinking about and expecting. There's coming a time where we will be gathered together in God's presence and all sin and all brokenness and all heartache and suffering and pain will be cast away, never to be encountered again. So we look forward to that. We look forward with great expectation to that. But in the meantime, we traverse this world. We pass through this world as sojourners who are encountering difficult things. In Christ... Think about those words. Christian is what many people use to label themselves when they choose to follow after Christ. Uh, I think that um, I, I've moved away from leaning a lot on this terminology because it's been diluted in our culture today. Last week we talked about Christian, that it was first used in Antioch to describe those who were followers of Christ. And we said that it meant that they were little Christ. They were people who, they are people who resemble Christ. They're chips off the block, so to speak. But that term has lost a lot of its meaning in our culture today. When we mention the term Christianity, it takes on a lot of different connotations for a lot of different people. Pew Research Center did a poll not too long ago, a few months ago, and they reported that 65% of Americans claim to be Christians. 65%. Now, that's down 12% from 10 years ago, from a decade ago when the number was 77%. That in itself can be disturbing, but still, even with that in mind, if you take those figures and think that two out of every three people in America claim to be followers of Christ, they claim to be Christian. And I ask you, based upon the attitudes, commitment to church, study and knowledge of the Bible, Christian ethics, do you think those figures are accurate? I don't think they are. I don't think that there's enough empirical evidence around us to support that two out of every three people in America are genuine Christian, that they're genuine followers of Christ, that they genuinely resemble Christ. Internationally, Christian is associated with the American way of life, American ideals, American practices, even American government. So it's not always a helpful term to use. So Paul used the term or the phrase, we'd say, in Christ. He, this was a favorite of his. He used it more than 160 times in his writings. I think that it's an important distinction to make. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, we read this. For as in Adam, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Later in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, we read, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, or Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Now, Jerry Bridges says that what Paul is getting at in these two verses is that God's way of dealing with humanity, uh, in the way of his dealing with humanity, there are two men at the forefront, Adam and Christ. And all the rest of us are represented before God by one or the other of these two men. There are two lines facing God. One of them lines up behind Adam. One lines up behind Christ. 
And the question that all of us must consider is, am I in Adam or am I in Christ? Now, many who claim to be Christian, they stop short of asking such a question. The truth of the matter is, the Word of God tells us that we are all in Adam. We're all behind Adam when we come into this world. Acts 17, 26 says, And he made from one man or from one blood every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. All of us, when Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, all of us were we're wrapped up in Adam. We're all in his, uh, in his genes. We all came forth out of Adam. And so when Adam fell, when Adam sinned, all of us fell with him. We're all in Adam's line. Our children prove the point. We observe it. We talk about it all the time. When they come into this world, we don't have to spend any time teaching them to do wrong things. We don't have to teach them to be disobedient. We don't have to teach them to uh, re rebel against us, against authority. They already know this. They're already bent in this direction because they are conceived in a fallen nature. They're conceived with this ability to sin, with this propensity to sin, with, with a rebel heart. Psalm 51, 5, David in his great prayer, confession after his sin with Bathsheba, said this. He said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was born in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In sin did my mother conceive me. Proverbs 20 and verse 9 says, Who can say, I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. Can anyone Psalm 53, 3 answers emphatically, saying, They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. Now, if that sounds familiar, you've probably heard it in Romans chapter 3. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned. For all have sinned. All are born in sin and have fallen short of the glory of God. That means that we have fallen short of God's standard of perfection, of God's standard of holiness, of righteousness. We are all in Adam. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, the payment, the penalty for our sin, for our rebellion is death. Death. The evidence is all around us about the state of our world and the state of humanity. COVID-19 is just the latest, greatest picture, depiction of our problem. Disease, sin, death. We continue to be reminded every day that our world has fallen, that our world is broken, that we are all descendants after Adam, that we're all in trouble before a holy and righteous God. Injustice characterizes this world. Injustice and justice, those are popular topics to talk about in our culture, but we want to pick and choose how we talk about them and when we talk about them. If someone tells a lie about you and costs you your job, you're going to get angry. You're going to get upset because you consider that to be an injustice. If someone bullies your child at school, you're going to get upset at the injustice. You're going, to want, you're going to want someone to do something, to administer justice, to set everything right again. If someone breaks into your home, steals, vandalizes, you're going to be upset. You're going to be angry. You're going to feel wounded. You're going to feel betrayed. You want something, someone to administer justice. You want the, the scales to be balanced again. And truth be known, most of us want the scales tilted in our favor rather than just balanced. You want justice. You demand justice. Ahmad Arbery, this case is unfolding before our eyes here in our own state. And right now, 
it's hard to know exactly what all the facts are. It's being reported uh, one way, portrayed one way. But uh, if what appears to be true is true, the outcry for justice is going to continue to escalate. It's going to become deafening as it appears and it, great injustice has, been, uh, has occurred. We want justice. But I want to ask you this morning, what about the ultimate injustice? What about the ultimate injustice? What am I talking about? I'm talking about a good and benevolent, gracious, loving creator who made all things, made this world and all that it has and presented it to us. He made us in his image to be image bearers. And we have performed mutiny against him. We're in rebellion. We're standing up before him and shaking our fist in defiance and saying, we want this world to be ours and we want to do it our way. How many people do you hear crying out for justice on God's behalf? How many people consider the way we live our lives every day, the fact that we're in Adam to be putting before God this incredible injustice. We're not so eager for justice then, are we? The wages of sin is death. Death is physical. We see the deterioration all around us. We feel it in our bodies. We see it as people leave this world. Their bodies grow weary, grow diseased, and they give out and die. This is a reminder of the curse that's upon all of creation and all of man because of sin, because we're in Adam. Jesus Christ came into the world. God in flesh. God taking on flesh. Why? He came to do what we could not do for ourselves, what we could not do before God. That is to live a righteous life, to fulfill the expectations of God. He came to do it on our behalf. And he came to do and suffer what we deserve. That is to go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sin. He came to die under the weight of our sin. And that's exactly what he did. He did this suffering, dying in place of the guilty so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be restored to fellowship with God, so that we could be appear to be righteous before God again, wearing, dawning His righteousness. When Christ arose from the dead, it was validation from God that He had accepted the work of Christ through His suffering and his death, that he had accepted that as sufficient payment for the sin of all who put their faith and trust in Christ. Now those of us who hear this gospel, we hear the call, we hear the truth about ourselves that we are in Adam. And when we become convicted of that, when we, when we are willing to uh, agree with God's indictment against us as sinners... I know that our culture, it's not, it's not popular to talk about these things. Uh, just the other day, I heard someone express this when, when confronted with this idea of sin that, well, I may talk about it, but I don't put it quite that bluntly. This is a grave problem for us. Thinking that that's some sort of uh, statement or term that's not politically correct. It's not something that we want to hear But we don't put those standards on the doctor when we go and get checked out for disease in the body. We want to know the truth so we can get a remedy. The same is true spiritually. We need to admit our sin to God. We need to agree with his indictment that we have offended him, that there is a grave injustice that's been done. Our sin is an affront to God. It's an abomination to God. And when we acknowledge that and we're willing to repent, We're willing to turn away from our sin and ourself and turn to Christ and put all of our hope and trust and faith in Him and Him alone, in what He has done for us. Take Him at His word. Become His and only His. 
then he imputes his righteousness to us. And God sees us as he sees him. Not through our sin any longer, but through the forgiveness, through the perfection of Christ. And we move from that line that's in Adam to the line that now we are in Christ. In Christ. Not just carrying a label, Christian, but being placed in Christ. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from the justice of God that is certainly coming. It's assured to be coming by his word. And we'll be placed in the Christ line, in Christ himself, where salvation from judgment is certain. Then you will be in Christ A few weeks ago, we talked about Noah and his ark, and that may be one of the most graphic pictures of what we're talking about here. When when the time came for the floodwaters to come and Noah had invested in uh, creating this ark according to God's design and the waters were getting ready to to fall, the, 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 uh, uh, the floods were going to burst forth, and God instructed Noah and his family to do what? Did he tell them, did he encourage them to... Grab hold of the sides of this ark and support yourself and hold on. As long as you can hold on, you'll weather the storm and come out on the other side. No, he didn't tell them that. Did he tell them to swim along with the ark as the waters begin to rise? Swim with the ark and help the ark, steer the ark and help support the ark. And you'll save yourself on the other side. No, he didn't tell them that. He didn't tell them to come out on the outside and if you can withstand the storm and ride it out, even on top of the ark, everything will be okay. That's not what he did either. The scripture says that he and his family went into the ark. They entered into the ark. And then Genesis 17 or Genesis 7 verse 16 says something interesting. It says, and the Lord shut him in. And the Lord shut the door and sealed it. And as the waters came, Noah and his family were saved from judgment because they were in the ark. In the same manner, those who put their faith and trust in Christ enter into Christ. And as certainly as he is going to be for all time in the presence of God, as he will not be subject to judgment, neither are those who are in Christ. This is the call to faith, being in Christ, being a Christ follower. Yes, truly resembling Christ, but being positioned in Christ. And when this occurs, then you become part of the community of faith, the church. Uh, For the same reason that we might move away from the term Christian to something more accurate like in Christ for our culture today, maybe we need to think about the church being thought of something other than using the word church. Church is used to point to the building, to the mortar, the bricks, when in fact it should be pointing to the people. So thinking about the community of faith, the local assembly of faith, the people who are in Christ, who come together This is a design by the Scripture. Those in Christ are called and expected to do life together. We move through the challenges and the difficulties, the hardships, the pain and the suffering. We do it together. As we do it together, God has put us together in order to encourage and help one another as we move through these things. We are God's family, a community joined together by faith in Christ. Some things we know about this community of faith from Scripture. Matthew chapter 16 and 18, you'll remember the night before Jesus' arrest and crucifixion that he was asking the disciples who men said that he was. And Peter made his great profession of faith there. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, upon this profession, I'm going to what? Build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
What an incredible statement that he made. I will build my church. I'm going to do the work. Bring and gather my people together. And the gates of hell cannot stop it. The gates of hell cannot come against us successfully. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he instructs the community of faith to go forth and make disciples. As you're going through this world, no matter whether there are trials and tribulations or difficulties, make disciples as you go. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And teach them all the things that I've commanded, he said. This, these are marching orders for the community of faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, kind of offers us a developing uh, message coming out of Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, telling us, uh, explaining to us the church that we have confidence in the blood of Christ that redeems us, that saves us. We have a great high priest in Christ. We, we don't need to fear. We don't need men to stand before us as intermediaries between us and God. We have a mediator one who is Christ, who also gave himself and has purchased our redemption and provides our access to the Father. We are confident in his shed blood. We do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, he says, as is the habit of some. So it's important that we come together, that we turn our focus and attention toward the Word of God together that we do life together, that we encourage and pray for one another, that we hold each other accountable in this faith together. There are lots of conversations these days about shelter in place and what it's going to do to the church. I remind you, as Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We are going to move forward. God will see to it. He may use this as an opportunity to purge, to prune, to challenge, to reform, to strengthen even the remnant of believers that are willing to follow him no matter what. Some things are certainly going to change, but we will still be a community of faith. We will still be a community of faith. We will reboot by focusing on only on the simple and the basic here. We've determined that that will be true. And this will probably be a good exercise for all of us to think about what really we should be doing as a church. What should we be focused on? What should be driving our passions? What should we be affectionate about? Each other. Honoring Christ in all things. And allow Him to lead us forward carefully, deliberately, according to his plans and his purposes. Do only that which enables us to fulfill our mission and avoid distractions. But Peter gets into the community of faith here. He offers an exhortation to the elders. The elders. Now, what does that mean? Is he talking about those who are older in age? Well, if you've been around this church for very long, you know that's not true. That elders is a synonymous term with pastor. These are the shepherds of the church. These are the spiritual leaders of the church. We understand there are two offices that Scripture uh, has designed for the church. One is the office of deacon, the role of deacon, and that of elder. Deacons have responsibility for practical matters regarding the body of Christ, uh, taking care of those practical matters, practical needs in the body, uh, encouraging, strengthening, and serving the body. This began in Acts chapter 6. We see the first portrait of what we believe to be deacons, even though the term, uh, the specific term was not used there. The Hellenist widows were being neglected by the church, and it was creating tension. And, and there was, uh, people were clamoring for something to be done. And they went to the apostles, and the apostles said, look, it's not good for us to be distracted from praying and from studying the Word of God. So you choose from among yourselves, choose from among yourselves men who are full of the Spirit, men who are of godly character, and give this task to them and ask them to do it. 
Later, Paul formalized the role in his pastoral letters. And I'm glad to say and thankful to say that here in our church, we have, we have a wonderful, committed, and faithful deacons, servants of the church, who are literally the right hand to uh, the elders in the church. They administer benevolence funds and care for those who are in need. They serve our church helping those who are unable to help themselves. They serve on many ministry and service teams. They assist the elders as the proverbial right arm, as I said, to deal with the practical concerns. And then we have elders, and the elders are shepherds. They're pastors. They're spiritual leaders in the body. They have a responsibility to ensure that the body is following God's truth, to teach and nurture the body with God's truth, and to ensure that the church is fulfilling God's purpose. They protect and guard the body against false teachers, against spiritual predators. And if you look at the shepherd in agrarian life, in biblical times, it is the model that we should envision for this role of shepherding. Those shepherds, they didn't own the sheep, but they were stewards over the sheep, working for another who actually owned the sheep, just as elders in the church do. We do not own the church. We don't own the people in the church. We, we own nothing but the responsibility to care for, to care for the souls of these people. To protect against predators. Acts 20 and verses 25 through 31 provides uh, an excellent uh, insight into this role that we know as elders. Paul was preparing to uh, make his way back to Jerusalem and he was on his way back and he sent for the elders of Ephesus to meet him and there he challenged them and charged them in how to care for the church where they dwelt, which was at Ephesus. He focused on the caregiving as protecting and defending, making sure that they were able to stay on course for their faith. Peter says that the shepherds, the elders are exercising oversight. It means to inspect. It means to look in on. It means to care for. Not to be aloof from, not to be distanced from, but if I can say it this way, to meddle in your business spiritually, to meddle in your business. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, talking about elders, that, that there's uh, honor for those who rule well. Now, that word rule is not a, a word that we like because of the connotation in our society today, but it, it means to lead, to direct, preside over, govern, care for, give aid to. These are all positive things. They're not oppressive things. They're, it's not uh, the making or the calling of tyrants. We have primarily the responsibility to teach the Word of God and equip the sheep for ministry. And he goes on to tell us how they should shepherd. How should these elders shepherd the congregation? Willingly, not under compulsion, not because they have to, because someone's forcing it, but willingly, embracing it as an opportunity, a joy even, gladness even, under God's call. They are to do it eagerly, not for ulterior motives, not, not because they're looking uh, through greedy lenses, looking for what they can gain from it, not looking for uh, a position of power or even prestige, but doing it eagerly, understanding the importance of the task, understanding the importance of the need in the body of Christ, and to do it conscientiously, not domineering over them, not oppressing, not, not being bosses over the body of Christ, but leading by example, he says, giving them examples in the faith. And he says, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. The unfading crown of glory. This is a reference to the amaranth flower whose red color uh, did not fade. It stayed vibrant. 
He seems to be using this, and it makes, a, it makes an incredible contrast to what Peter said earlier in chapter 1, verse 24, when he was talking about all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. These are the things of men. But when we do things in the design of God, in Christ, through the power of God working in us, we find and reap the unfading crown of glory, that which doesn't pass away, that which doesn't ebb away, which remains vibrant for the glory of God. Not only does he provide exhortation to the shepherds, to the elders, but he provides exhortations to the church body. He offers six things that the church body needs to do here. Those who are under the charge of the elders. Number one, be subject. That is submit. Another ugly word, right? Another word that we don't particularly take a shine to in our culture today. We're, we want to be self, uh, you know, we want this uh, self-autonomy. We want to be independent. We don't want anyone telling us what to do or having even the inkling that they might be trying to tell us what to do. We don't want to answer to anyone. We want to be our own people. But this is not the way of God. God says that being submissive toward one another is a part of the Christian faith. That we submit ourselves to one another. Put yourself under God's design. He is the ultimate chief shepherd. And those that he has established in positions of leadership in the community of faith are his under shepherds. And just like if you were uh, conscientiously defiant toward the government in an area that uh, God has not spoken clearly about, you're violating God's principles. He says that we're to be submissive, to submit ourselves to the governing authorities as long as they're not asking us to violate God's word. And the same is applied in the body of Christ. To those that God has put in places to lead, to direct, to be responsible for the care of your soul. So cooperate. Be clothed, he says, in humility. We have a saying in our culture, and it, uh, it, it goes without saying, I guess. It, uh, there's different ideas about clothing, about wardrobes, but there's a saying in our culture that clothes make the man. That as you wear, what you wear uh, evidently says something about who you are, defines you in some way. Well, if that's true, Peter hits the nail on the head here. He says, be clothed, be wrapped, have it firmly wrapped around you, this humility, humility. That's going against the culture as well. It's not something that comes easily for us because we are prideful. We're, we're boastful. He says if we want to be the true community of faith, this is where it's got to begin. Be clothed in humility. Humble under God. Humble one to another. Even those who lead, even those who are in positions of, of oversight and leadership, be examples in humility. Trust God. In verse 5, he said, verse 6, I'm sorry, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of of God. This says that even when we are in this culture where adversity occurs and we find ourselves suffering for the cause of Christ, humble ourselves under the hand of God. Trust God that He is indeed still sovereign. He is still master over everything happening. And if He has deemed this for our lives, if He has ordained it and allowed it and permitted it and caused it to come into our lives, then He's doing so for a reason, and we can humble ourselves under Him and endure it. Trust Him, even though things may not be what you want them to be. He says, be sober-minded. Be clear-headed. This is... Uh, in contrast to someone who would be uh, inebriated, someone who would be drunken with the things of this world. 
You know, when, when someone is under the influence of alcohol or another drug, they, they don't have any control over themselves. They, they stagger when they walk and, and they slur their speech and they make poor decisions. Uh, sometimes their personality will go in an opposite direction of what normally would be true of them. These people are not in control of themselves. They're out of control and they're being controlled by what is over, over filling their, their lives at that moment. But he says we are to be clear-headed, not inebriated with the ways and the allure of the world, but to be clear-headed so that we think things through from the, from the context of God's Word, from, from God's perspective on things. See things as God sees them. Walk as God would have us walk. And then he says we are to resist the devil it's an interesting uh, description that he gives us of the enemy as a lion roaring and prowling about. You know, roaring and prowling about. Uh, someone who, a predator that is looking for those whom he may devour, whom he may destroy. The scripture says that we are engaged in a spiritual war. But it's amazing to me how many people I hear and see in evangelical circles that want to uh, trivialize this spiritual war and talk about uh, taking on the devil. They want to take the fight to the devil. They, they're willing to provoke him, to chase him. But we're not encouraged to do that. That's not the way that we engage the enemy. Peter's writing here, he says we are simply to resist, to stand firm resisting the devil. Jesus gave us a perfect example in the, uh, during his wilderness wandering uh, when he was uh, 40 days in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 and he responded to the enemy's temptations. How? By going to him through the word of God, by responding to him through the word of God and simply resisting the temptations that the enemy put before him. There's a great lesson there for us as the body of Christ. And then he tells us that we are to look forward to God's future glory. Look forward to God's future glory. He says down there, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, the God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, will himself Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. All four of these terms are actually synonyms. They actually mean the same thing. And if we were going to uh, push this, condense this into uh, one short statement, it would be that he himself will put things right. He himself will put everything right. All the injustice that's going on, there's nothing wrong with being upset by that. There's nothing wrong with having righteous indignation about that. But we understand that ultimately God is going to put all things right. He's going to begin with his own justice. How he's been treated unjustly, unjustly by a sinful humanity. He's going to set it all right. And every injustice that's ever occurred, the scales, the accounts will be balanced. This is the promise we have. And he's going to set everything right. So if you are suffering because of Christ, if you're encountering persecution because of Christ, if you're experiencing ridicule or scorn, he's going to set it all right. He's going to put everything in its rightful place. Look forward to his future glory. And that enables us to endure. His final word in these final words, Three verses is an exhortation for us to stand firm in this true grace of God. What he's described, what he's saying here at the end of this is that I have laid out for you a portrait, a picture of true grace, of this journey of faith. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the weak-minded, the weak-willed. For those that, that, that are not willing to rest in the Lord and persevere through His power reigning in us. The world presents countless challenges because it's broken by sin. And it's particularly difficult for those who are in Christ, living for Christ. But God is using all things to exalt His name for our growth, for our good, as well as His name. 
Humble ourselves under God's hand, knowing he's in control. Humble ourselves toward one another. Understanding we all have our assignments from God. We all have our instructions from God. We all have the places where he has set us in order to do his bidding, to do his will. We should understand that about one another. And we should respect that about one another. Humble ourselves toward each other in that line of thinking. And after a little while, God will put everything right. God will put everything right. Perfect justice is coming at the hand of God. Are you prepared? Are you in Christ? Or are you in Adam? This is the question that all of us must ask. It's the only real true division of humanity. You're either in Christ or you're in Adam. It doesn't matter what your race, your ethnicity. It doesn't matter what your sex is. It doesn't matter what your economic status may be. It doesn't matter what your education level is. The only thing that matters is if you are in Christ or in Adam. In Christ or in Adam, he's the only ark, Christ is. He's the only ark of safety and deliverance. I encourage you today, if you are in Adam, to turn from your sin, to repent of your sin and turn to Christ, to throw yourself on his mercy. He's a good and benevolent God, filled with love and gladness and joy who will take care of your injustices and make you right before God. He will set you right before God. You cannot survive on your own. You may think you're surviving, but you're not. Only in Christ. And when we're in Christ, not only do we survive, we thrive. We thrive even in a world, even in a world of sin and hurt and sorrow. The chief shepherd is our head if you're in Christ. He's your master. He's over you. The under shepherds God has given you, the elders. I encourage elders, leaders in the church to shepherd well those that God has put in our charge. To shepherd well, to do it conscientiously, to do it willingly, to do it eagerly. For the glory of God and for the good of the community of faith. And those who are sheep, those who are Christ followers, follow well. Follow well, trusting those that God has put in position to serve him by leading his people. Follow well. Follow Christ who has called us all. Let's pray together. Master, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the incredible design of uh, the, the body of Christ, the, the bride of Christ, that those who are in you comprise. Lord, give us better understanding, not only of what it is and how we are a part of it, but what it means to function as the body of Christ. Lord, we pray, we know that it is your design and your purpose that the body of Christ serve you well, reflect your glory well in this world. Like a city on a hill, you, you said we are, that others may be directed toward you, may be drawn to you through what they see in us. We thank you for the words that have challenged, encouraged, and hopefully comforted our hearts as we continue to sojourn through this world. I pray for those this morning, Lord, who do not know you, do not have a personal relationship with you, who are still struggling under the weight of sin and its guilt. I pray that even now your spirit might bring conviction and repentance and freedom forgiveness and restoration to you. Put them right, we pray, that they might not just survive, but thrive. May thrive for your glory. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. going to sing a song called Thrive. Some of you are familiar with it. It was recorded uh, by Casting Crowns. If you know it, I encourage you to sing with me. If not, listen to this song. Let's thrive in the Lord. Here in this worn and weary land where many a dream has died Like a tree planted by the water we never will run dry So living water flowing through God we thirst for more of you Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire Just to know you and to make you known We lift your name on high Shine a light sun and darkness run and hide. We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. Digging deep to know our Father's heart. Into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. run and hide. We will, we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. Joy unspeakable, faith Unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Just to run and hide. We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. Oh, by faith and not by 
sight. By faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of His promise in their hearts. And the holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw a day when the Lord Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good By faith the mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible, for all who call upon His name. And we will stand as children of the promise, we will fix our eyes on Him, our souls. Reward till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight, and we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Oh Lord, we are grateful for this day in which we've been able to gather in our homes and worship you. Lord, we thank you for this time when we've been able to crack open your holy word. Lord, we pray that you would walk with us this week. We thank you that you will. Lord, as we go throughout this day and the days ahead, may we thrive in you. And Lord, we thank you for who you are for what you've done in and through us. Lord, may it be for your glory. And we thank you that it's also for our good. It's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you.